Hello and good morning all of you to this vlog and in this vlog I am going to discuss a very very important recent development which has happened in the cost accounting world which is with respect to the revision of erstwhile cost accounting standard 4. So guys with effect from 1st March 2019 the new cost accounting standard 4 has been uh, uh, replaced has replaced the earlier cost accounting standard 4 and with effect from 1st March 2019 the new cost accounting standard 4 will be applicable uh, on all the companies who are eligible to prepare their cost sheets or cost records. Now the first and foremost question arises that sir um, uh, do you think that for June 2019 attempt this cost accounting standard update will be relevant? So guys at the outset I would let you know that this cost accounting standard revised will not be applicable for June 2019 attempt. This might be applicable for December 2019 attempt, but no notification has been issued by the Institute of Cost Accountants of India in this regard. So please don't presume anything. Let's wait for the notification from the Institute whether this CAS will be applicable or not. And then this CAS will be applied for the examination purposes as well. Sir, then why are you preparing this video? Why do we need to study or know the provisions of cost accounting standard 4 which is revised? The answer is very simple. Guys, after clearing your examination, you have to be in the professional world and you have to be updated with the latest developments of the professional world. And that is the reason why I am discussing the broad structure of this cost accounting standard, the reasons for bringing this cost accounting standards in and what are the changes which we are going to envisage in the way we are doing cost accounting for um, now with relation to this cost accounting standard. So this is just for your general knowledge that I'm sharing some uh, few high level points on cost accounting standard 4. So first of all, so what is the reason for updating the cost accounting standard 4? Guys, the reason is very simple. With the introduction of GST Goods and Services Act, uh, the, uh, the uh, incidence of tax has shifted from manufacture to supply. So in the erstwhile regime, in the excise law regime, the incident of tax was on the manufacture of or production of goods. However, in the GST regime, the emphasis is on the supply of goods. And therefore, there is a need for this revised CAS. Now we are moving from a manufacture based regime to a supply based regime. This is the basic reason for introduction of this cost accounting standard. The name of the cost accounting standard has also undergone a change. Last uh, cost accounting standard was, was named as cost accounting standard on captive consumption. This cost accounting standard is named as cost accounting standard on cost of production or acquisition or supply of goods or provision of services. The reason is very simple that the erstwhile regime was based on manufacture and this regime is based on supply. Therefore, there is a change in the uh, terminology which has been used and pursuant to this change in the GST law we have seen the, the change coming in in CAS cost accounting standard 4. So yes GST is in place and GST levies tax on the supply of goods be it a captively consumed good or otherwise GST will levy tax on the supply of goods. So supply of goods also include a good which is captively consumed and if it is moved from one factory to another factory, from one location to another location, from a registered dealer to a registered dealer, then GST will be applicable. Now the rule which we are going to deal with in the GST law um, uh, with respect to this cost accounting standard will be guys rule 30 and rule 31 of the GST law. So rule 30 and 31 of the GST law are the residuary rules whereby they say that if the supply of goods or services are not uh, the value is not determinable by any other rule then you can apply rule 30 or rule 31. Rule 30 is um, uh, giving you a leeway of considering 110% of the cost of production as the amount of supply and rule 31 is giving you a open hand to determine the the uh, method uh, of uh, uh, determine the method of computation of value as per the established standards so these are the rules which are the residuary rules for cgst and hence because of these residuary rules we have we want to have a cost accounting standard which tells us how can we um, compute the cost because on that cost 10% markup will be added and then the supply the value of supply will be determined 
So on the basis of rule number 30, this cost accounting standard will provide us the cost of provision of services or cost of supply of goods. So let us start with the body of the cost accounting standard guys. So cost accounting standard deals with production of goods, acquisition of goods, supply of goods and provision of provision or supply of services. So these are the four broad criteria where the uh, cost accounting standard will apply. Fifth element where cost accounting standard will apply is determination of value of supply of goods or service as per the open market value or as per the goods or services of like kind and quality. This is also covered by the cost accounting standard. So this is the broad scope of cost accounting standard and I am skipping the basic definitions because those are very basic definitions and I'm coming to the key points of or the key provisions of this cost accounting standards. Guys, it's a broad overview. I have not analyzed in detail, but I'm just discussing the broad concept which has been introduced in this cost accounting standard. So uh, like the earlier cost accounting standard, there are eight elements which are to be added uh, while determining the cost of production. What are those eight elements guys? Material cost, direct wages and salaries, direct expenses, works overhead, quality control cost, research and development cost, packing cost, administrative overhead relating to production. These are the same eight principles which were uh, eight elements which were there in the erstwhile cast. The same will add up to form the cost of production of goods. Now coming on to cost of production of services. Now cost of production of services contain seven elements. The element which is lacking is packing material cost is has been excluded uh, from the cost of provision of services. Naturally, uh, in most of the cases, uh, while providing services, packaging cost should not be an element to it. However, I feel that there are some instances where packing cost will be there and therefore packing cost should be there. Uh, the instances are like you receive SIM cards from a telecommunication um, uh, industry in telecommunication industry while buying a, um, a telecom license. You buy the SIM and SIM comes in a packet. So there is a possibility that even for provision of services, packing material cost can be incurred. So I think the idea behind not including packing cost would have been that that cost can be um, included in operation overheads, point number six. But yes, certainly it doesn't seem like the idea would be to not to include packing cost. The idea might not be that, idea might be that packing cost should be included in operation overheads. So these are the seven elements um, which are included in cost of provision of services. What are those seven elements? Material cost, employee cost, expenses, quality control cost, research and development cost, operation overheads and administrative overheads. Then there are, these are general definitions which have been discussed in many cost accounting standards, depreciation, defectives. You can just go through them yourself. Uh, next important element is guys, uh, employee cost. Yes, in the definition of employee cost, there's a specific exclusion. Please take note of this. Contract employees include employees directly engaged by the employer on contract basis, but does not include employees of any contractor engaged in the organization. So guys, in while computing the employee cost, you have to include the employees directly engaged by the employer on contract basis. However, if there are employees of the contractor who are working in your premises, since they are not your employees, hence the, their cost should not be included in the employee cost. Very logical, very reasonable. Now, I would like to highlight over here is that in the erstwhile CAS, Provident Fund, ESI, subsidized food, etc. The components of all these um, employee costs were also enumerated. It is a presumption that those elements should be included in this cost as well because obviously the all the cost the definition says that employee benefits paid or payable in all forms of consideration should be included so so uh, so um, the logical conclusion should be that pfi esi pf esi etc all the cost should be included in the employee cost then idle capacity installed capacity these are all generic definitions Yes, interest and finance cost, which is to be excluded while computing the cost is also enumerated and it's three components, interest and commitment, finance charges in nature of finance lease and exchange differences on account of Forex has been included in interest cost. 
now comes on to a now let us come on to a very important definition which is material consumed guys in this definition there are two addition as compared to the earlier definition the two additions are one is they have added material received free of cost or at concessional value from the buyer so the buyer of the good if he supplies you uh, any good which is free of cost any material which is free of cost then that cost should be included in the material consumed now my question I was just thinking I was just questioning myself uh, if we have received something free of cost how can we include its cost in the material consumed is it an imputed cost would we impute that cost because there's no mechanism of ascertaining what is the cost of that free of cost material which has been received from the buyer so i guess gst will come to our rescue and the values which are given in gst law we can value these free of cost goods in a similar manner as which as the the, the ones which are enumerated in the gst law second is accessories which are supplied along with the final products this is an addition which has been made so all the accessories um, uh, which are supplied with the final product forms part of the material consumed okay i'll tell you a similar um, uh, element was there in the earlier definition also by the name of additives so i think this is similar to additives so there's only one additional point which is material received free of cost at concessional value from the buyers so yes this definition more or less remains the same now we move on to the operative part of the cost accounting standard the operative part which basically deals with principles of measurement of cost of production or acquisition of goods it again contains the the basic elements of uh, cost guys um, so the cost should be ascertained separately for each type of goods and services direct and direct cost should be included direct and direct cost relating to service should be included material cost measured separately for each type of material now very important point which is point num clause number 9.5 guys oh, sorry 5.5 guys 5.5 deals about deals with scrap scrap which is realized should be deducted from cost of production absolutely logical now the gas is silent on the scrap which is reprocessed remember the earlier gas had a clause on reprocessed scrap as well it gave a mechanism of valuing the reprocessed scrap as well however this gas is silent about reprocessed scrap which is giving a hint that probably we do not need to treat reprocessed scrap at all in our cost sheet this is the only logical conclusion which i can derive from this treatment of scrap or defectives then uh, goes on to say uh, employee cost utilities packing material direct expenses high value spare all these provisions are absolutely the same as compared to the earlier cash depreciation amortization now when one very important aspect to note is guys this is intended use concept has been introduced or has been utilized in depreciation and amortization very very important guys the asset should be ready for intended use only then you can claim the depreciation put to use concept is of course not there it's ready to use and that too ready for intended use so i'll give you an example suppose there's a telecommunication industry which is into um, uh, in installing the towers for telecommunication signals and it is not into providing services with respect to the signals but just installing the towers now tv towers requires a license now suppose a tv tower is fully installed it is in workable condition ready to use condition you just have to press the button and it will install and it will work but it has not received license from the regulator now would you say that the asset should be capitalized would you say that asset is ready to use answer is yes you would say that ready asset is ready to use but you cannot say that asset is ready for intended use because intended use is to provide telecommunication signals until the time you get a license from the regulator you cannot perform the telecommunication uh, services so this is an example of difference between ready to use and ready to ready for intended use so intended word is very very important in this definition then uh, joint products by products treatment is absolutely the same royalty technical know how one time fees should be amortized on the basis of output or benefits derived from related technical know how quality control cost production overheads 
nothing major to discuss with you guys you can obviously go through these clauses yourself now again again same question which i had asked you cost of input receive free of cost which cost should we consider while computing the cost of production because now there's a dichotomy over here that it includes cost of free of cost goods but which cost should we consider so let's see what is the solution to it i am coming on to para 5.25 which is really important subsidy or grant or incentive any such payment received or receivable from any entity please uh, note the words in the brackets other than recipient of goods or services so if recipient of goods or services gives you subsidy then it is not to be treated in the manner which is given in para 5.25 then the question arises how would we treat the subsidy or grant which is given by recipient of goods or services what is the treatment to that subsidy or grant now this is an open question which to which the logical answer would be of course it should be uh, reduced from the uh, cost because he has given you the buyer has given you the subsidy so it should be reduced from the cost this is a logical answer but the reason for excluding it from here uh, I am not able to precisely guess what is the reason of excluding it from here, but the logical conclusion would be that yes, it should be reduced from uh, the cost of production. Then comes on to the grants, fines and penalties, same provisions, statutory authority or other third party, either the penalties or damages are levied by statutory authority or other third party, they should be excluded, forex component should be excluded, credits and recoveries should be excluded work in progress should be adequately taken into account with respect to the stage of completion of those work in progress then comes the assignability guys assignability is again based on those two guiding principles those two guiding principles are cause and effect relationship and benefits received relation uh, benefits received so these are the two guiding principles for apportioning or assigning these cost joint cost now um, there are certain methods which are prescribed for treating joint cost guys those methods are very very logical methods shall be assigned to the joint product based on the benefits received measured by using the option number one physical units method or equivalent cost option two equivalent cost option three net realizable value at the split off point so joint cost will be allocated to both the goods on the basis of these three elements now net realizable value has been defined means the net selling price per unit multiplied by quantity sold adjusted for post split off cost. So this is the net realizable value uh, definition. So yes, they have given additional examples for uh, the institute has given additional examples for allocating this joint cost presentation disclosure. Now, from a disclosure standpoint, there are three append uh, four appendices which have been prescribed by the institute these are the appendix so refer rule 30 of cgst rule 2017 cost of production of taxable goods however um, rule 30 doesn't mention about these appendices these appendix so um, uh, this refers to rule 30 but rule 30 doesn't refer to this annexure so uh, can they be used strictly for uh, gst purposes answer is a yes they can be used because institute has prescribed them so they should be used while computing the uh, cost of production of taxable goods under rule 30 this is appendix 1 for taxable goods appendix 2 is for taxable services cost of production of taxable services this is appendix 2 then appendix 3 is for ascertaining the cost of acquisition the appendix 1 was for ascertaining the cost of production this is for ascertaining the cost of acquisition of taxable goods this is appendix 3 and appendix 4 which refers to the statement of open market value or value as per goods or services of like kind and quality so if you are using this method which is prescribed by rule 27 to 29 then this is the appendix for you which has been prescribed and of course this has to be signed by the cost accountant who is reviewing or who is um, uh, dealing with this particular provision so um, that's a brief overview on the cost accounting standard please guys i know um, this video will be seen by a lot of practicing cost accountants as well and i would request all of them to please comment on um, uh, their expert knowledge their practical knowledge with respect to this cost accounting standard and what are the questions which are there in their mind also 
So what I'll do is I'll gather all the questions and I'll probably forward it to the vice president or the president of the institute so that all our unanswered questions with respect to the revised cost accounting standard 4 can be answered by the institute by way of an FAQ or a clarification or something like that. I know thing is new. New things take some time to gel in. So this will also take some time to gel in. That is perfectly fine. It's really okay. And I would hope that yes, we are uh, uh, moving towards a direction where we are integrating cost accounting standards with the other laws which are prevalent in the country and um, nothing better than uh, doing this, taking this step so that it's easy for the companies also to uh, interpret these um, cost accounting standards and use them effectively and do not see them as, an bur as a burden on them, but do see them as a integrated, whole integrated process. So yes, that's all for the vlog today. And uh, for all the students who are working for June 2019 attempt, guys, time is really, really less now. Only and only two months, broadly two months to go. Um, if I exclude the holy uh, breaks, which you'll be celebrating these days, only two months to go. So really work hard. All the very best and happy studying.